Carla Caswell, how are you? Hello, <laughs> good to see you. And you. And where are you today? I'm in Bali currently. <laughs> You've been on a few travels, haven't you? you, you you're like a tra traveling, traveling, well, traveling perfectionist queen. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's definitely thrown the perfectionist right out the window when it comes to traveling. That's what I like to hear. It's, it's like, it's what I call it organized chaos. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sometimes just chaos. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just go with it. Just go with it. You know, we're completely opposite because my life is completely organized chaos. Get better than them perfect. And, um, but, you know, it doesn't matter just because you you like your, your your perfectionism and everything. It just puts you in a different path, you know, a path of uh, a part of a journey sort of thing. But we met. I think we met actually on Paul Reese. Now Paul Reese was on on Monday. He actually opened the uh, launch oh, with his. I, I know with his amazing way of of actually putting getting things over to us, and and he's a a master magician with his words. I love it. I love it. Absolutely. Um, so he was our coach, and then he started to some a mastermind, and we were, and then he invited us both on, didn't we, to be like the 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 professionals in his mastermind. Which was, I know. <laughs> what a privilege! <laughs> Absolutely. I really thought I'd yeah. made it then. <laughs> Yeah, me too. I was like, oh, me? I can't. I'm not a dream team. <laughs> yeah, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. Um, and then um, you've, done a, you've done a bit of work for me last year, the year before, on my social media. And we just yeah. stayed in touch. And I followed your journey because you've got an amazing journey. Um, got something to actually inspire people with, which... And like I've said all week is that I've asked people on here who have inspired me with the journey that they've actually taken. And I've learned so much from everybody. Um, so Carla Caswell, without further ado, where did this, and you coach a bit, on, you coach a lot on perfectionism and you talk a lot on perfectionism, but there's like a story to it. Everybody's got the story of why they, they, they are ending up where they are. So where did it all start for Carla? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we often think perfectionism is like something that we just, you know, we're just very organized or we just like things in a certain way. But actually, it's a huge part of who we are as an individual. Um, you know, I realized that I do things without even thinking about it. It's just second nature for me. And actually to stop doing those things, I have to be very conscious about, you know, changing yeah. those habits. Um, so, yeah, for me, it started when I was uh, nine years old. Um, I, I'll be honest, I, I grew up in a very traditional British family, um, mm -hmm. um, even though I grew up in South Africa. And um my family were very strict and so I think I had a, probably an essence of perfectionism already because you know everything had to be in its place and all of that wow. kind of thing um but it really kicked off for me um when my mom died when I was nine um so it was a very traumatic experience because it was actually my father who killed my mom um in an argument that they they had um you know, it, it, they'd had a tumultuous relationship, um, but it sort of all kicked off one night. Um, and it, it's it's a, such a, a weird thing for me to talk about because a lot of people immediately would kind of, I guess, go to, oh, my God, that that's a horrendous man, like all of that. But actually, I ended up still growing up with my dad um, yeah. because for whatever reasons um, – he didn't end up in, in prison, um, but he actually, if you ever met him, is the kindest, softest soul. And, and you know, yeah. you just don't always understand what's going on um, in a relationship. Um, however, what happened was on the on the night, my, my dad, obviously, after it happened, he took himself straight to the police station to turn himself in mm -hmm. um, and left me in the house. Um, 
obviously just wow. not even thinking, just panicked. And, um, yeah. and so I actually ended up going downstairs and I saw my mom was, you know, kind of not alive. <laughs> and, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess as a, as a kid, I just panicked and I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not supposed to be out of bed. I'm supposed to be asleep. I'm not supposed to know any of this. Is you were going to get into trouble. You were going to get into yeah. trouble then. Yeah. 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 And, and that was just my, my default thought. So I sort of ran back to bed and, and the evening sort of transpired in, in terms of uh, family friends came over and took me, um, to mm. their house. Um, <laughs> The, the one part that I, I feel like is just the most ridiculous part of the whole story, more than actually the incident, was yeah. um, I was due to go and uh, compete in a swimming competition because I was a like, professional swimmer back then already. Yeah. And and I literally got sh- sent – I went off to my competition for the weekend um, <laughs> and competed in in another in another county um, – you know, as a nine-year-old. But, but and... nobody had kn- knew that you'd gone downstairs and seen your mum. No, no. So, so in their doesn't... minds, their minds, they just thought it's best for Carla to carry on, go to her swimming competition. She knows nothing, and we can sort everything out why she's gone. Because <laughs> you're only nine at the end of the day. So, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think anybody sort of maybe realised, like, that it was strange that I'd been uprooted in the middle of the night and I was now at somebody else's house I don't think yeah. anyone had processed what I might be thinking about that no, <laughs> um, no. but yeah so off I went um and and as as the child I was um I came back with medals and <laughs> did my thing yeah. And, um yeah. And yeah, and then my dad sat me down that that Sunday evening and and said that you know something had happened and um, you know, mom, mom, there'd been an accident, um, and it, and I feel like that was the moment for me that was pivotal for the rest of like my next thirty years of my life, because okay. in that moment, I chose to say nothing, um, and I never. I didn't. I don't know if it was a lack of bravery or confidence to, you know, especially in a British family where kids are supposed to be seen and not heard, and yeah. so you're never taught to be open with your feelings and your emotions and and to speak yeah. up. And so in that moment, I chose to not say anything, and I just acknowledged that this was going to be my path. That I was just going to pretend like I didn't know anything. <laughs> Um, and that, I that, guess, isn't that a huge responsibility for a nine-year-old to take on her shoulders? Absolutely. Huge responsibility. Yeah. Oh, huge responsibility for you, and you carried that through. So nobody ever knew then. You knew. No. Um, you kept that with you for all your. How long did you keep that with you for? Oh gosh. Um, I think the first person I told was probably an ex-boyfriend who well ended up being my husband um and that I was about 21 I think so 10 years you carried that for yeah and actually I never I never told my dad never knew and you know and he passed away when I was 27 and um he, he never knew um and I just didn't have the heart to to tell him I I suspect he may have suspected something because I I, saw, I had an incident when I was about 19 um, where I wanted to attempt suicide and I sought help mm-hmm. from a friend. Um, but as a, as a student, I needed my dad to pay for the counselling. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I had to say that there was something happening um, and, you know, he sort of just happily paid and, and whatever. But so I suspect he may have thought something was going on there but again there was no communication in our household (laughs) no and I think if it's like that traditional sort of way of thinking it's like best underneath brushed underneath the carpet and here's the money yet you sort yourself out because I suppose he didn't want to take responsibility for it as well because then he would have had to own up to it then as well wouldn't he and and maybe I don't know 
what would have happened yeah. so what happened to you then in your early years because this charm trauma now would have come out you just said counseling would have come yeah. out even though you didn't say anything would have come out in other ways yeah Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think basically what, what kind of transpired was I was now in an environment of a lot of adults experiencing a huge amount of grief, um, but me not being able to experience that grief and not really understanding what was happening. And so I had my dad who had this obviously huge guilt um, on his shoulder. So I sort of went into this mode of trying to keep everybody happy. Because I felt like if everyone was happy, then my what was left of my family structure would remain. And I think it was a fear of losing anybody else. Um, yeah. So, you know, I had to kind of deal with my grand's grief um, and, you know, deal with my dad's guilt. And so that's where the perfectionism, I guess, kicked in because I just decided to become the perfect child. I was not going to rock the boat. I was going to achieve everything I needed to achieve. I was going to just make sure that if I was doing good, then everybody was happy, you know. Wow. And and that's sort of, I guess, how the rest of my life sort of transpired was all about living for other people and being, you know, perfect at my job, perfect at whatever sport I was doing, perfect at everything, and just setting this completely unrealistic standard for myself constantly um, yeah, yeah. and just trying to live up to the standard that I I thought for many years the world was putting on me but it was actually myself <laughs> yeah exactly exactly what a massive responsibility for you as a young person that's huge isn't it to actually take on you you were actually taking on the role of an adult by yeah. trying to make sure that everybody was happy and and then, and I suppose it's difficult, isn't it? Because when you're in that grief, the adults are in grief as well. They, you know, and I suppose if a child is, seems to be doing okay, they, oh, Carla's okay. Carla's fine. Yeah. She's smiling. She's making sure, you know, oh, I can't believe how brave Carla is. Carla's great. Yeah, yeah, Carla's fine. So we'll concentrate on our grief. It's, it's actually yeah. so interesting that you said that because years later when I, I did counseling and things I I had a lot of anger and resentment I was carrying with me which I never realized um yeah. and it was so much resentment around why was nobody there for me why did nobody look at me and go what nine-year-old copes that well with the death of their mother no. um even if they didn't you know even if they didn't know that I knew this, this real story just the loss of a mother you know, what kid continues to go get A's at school and continues to make, you know, county teams and do all of these things? Like, it was just unnatural. But then I, like you've just said, late on in life, I kind of did an exercise, actually with Paul, I did okay. an exercise where I basically had to write letters from my family members to me. And, and suddenly when I put myself in their shoes, I realized what you've said is that they – they were so consumed with their own grief and what they were dealing with. And they sort of looked at me and went, okay, she's all right. Like, she's yeah. okay. Like, okay, yeah. that's fine. Um, there was no signs. There was no signs for them to, 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 to worry about you. And, uh, yeah. then they just, but they most probably done a glimpse, you know, it's, it's one of those like scan reads, isn't it? And you don't yeah. really, the scan read, she's smiling. Yeah, that's okay. We'll carry on with our grief sort of thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I just internalized it all and then just yeah. took in this perfectionist attitude to to everything um, and, and always putting myself last. I think that was the biggest thing. I just, I always put myself last. It was like, and that, that I took into relationships, into my marriage, into my work. Um, you know, it was always giving more than I was able to give and also to, to receive. And I think it's 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 a it's a huge thing for women. I, I don't if you're listening to this right now, write in the comments. I could be wrong, but it's, this is just from my per um, perception, right? It's a huge thing with women where they where they try and make sure everybody's okay and um they put themselves 
last and it's because of something that's happened to them in their childhood that makes them like you like you said so before we go into the strategies what you've used where are you actually with that today yeah so i mean i think these sorts of things i think are a lifelong journey like you know once something's so ingrained in you you know, you don't just wake up one day and, you know, do a couple of affirmations and you're fine. <laughs> um, so, it's uh, it's nice. yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. Ta -da, I'm changed. Ta -da. <laughs> exactly. And um, I think for me, it's very much about like, you know, when you go through things in life and I'm constantly, I mean, you can see like I never live in one place. And so I'm constantly yeah. pushing my comfort zone and my boundaries. And that is going to bring up stuff that I didn't know I had, or I thought I'd maybe dealt with and hadn't really. And, and so my default is to always go into that sort of perfectionist mode and to also yeah. shut down. Like, I think it was always my default to shut down my emotions and just, switch off um yeah. so for me i think it's very much about the awareness has been a huge learning for me is just if you can have awareness around your your stuff your baggage um yeah. then you can yeah. then you can address it when it comes up um because there's you know i have times where something comes up and i think oh where did that come from? Yeah. <laughs> you know? I thought oh, I'd wow. fix that. I thought I'd solve that. It, it actually happened to me uh, this week, uh, uh, actually, where um, I sort of said yes to something that in my head I was like, you shouldn't be saying yes to this. You shouldn't be saying yes to this. You should be saying no. Claire saying no. And <laughs> guess what? It went wrong. <laughs> and I was like, shouldn't have said yes to that. <laughs> Lessons learned. Like, Why haven't I? Why haven't I listened to my own advice? You know, <laughs> but oh you see it again. Yeah, it's like a recovering yes person. I heard the other day. Recover yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what. Yeah, absolutely. I say I'm a recovering perfectionist because um, it's it's every day and one day at a time. And you know, I think yeah. it's very much just about learning to be aware, but also learning to be a little bit kinder to myself, which I think is really hard because. You know, a lot of what perfectionism is 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 being really hard on yourself. Um, it's yeah. it's never, you know, you can set all the goals in the world and achieve all every single one of them, but it's never enough. So it's always the next thing or the next thing. And um, there's you so, know, so then if I, if I go back then to the, those goals you said and there's never enough, it's so you're never satisfied. So you mm. would never be satisfied. Okay, cheese bag, yeah, click click. I'm not going to take time to pat myself on the back or love yeah. myself for what I did. Next thing, let's go. Absolutely. Is it like that? Hundred percent. And and what you said there has been really key for me as well is is starting to acknowledge those moments where I'm like, actually, you know what? I did do a good job there. Well done, me. You know, <laughs> like, um, and and that's so important because otherwise it's just like yeah next thing next thing next thing and then you never feel like you're achieving anything or you never feel like you're making any progress because you you've already forgotten about the amazing thing you did yesterday um, yeah. and you're already on to the next thing because that's you know oh I need to and I think you know as well perfectionism tends to be heightened in ambitious people um, mm -hmm. because. You know, there's not a lot of people sitting on the couch drinking six pack of beer, watching Netflix, who really worry about perfectionist you know, <laughs> tendencies. Well, um, it just depends. It, it could be a certain type of beer. And it could be a certain type of <laughs> beer. program. You know, you never know. <laughs> write in the comments. <laughs> yeah, I mean, please enlighten me. Yeah, write in the comments if you're a perfectionist Netflix watcher. <laughs> Or be a drinker. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows? I know they have to watch Netflix in a certain order. I don't know. <laughs> you, you just don't know, do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so interesting, yeah. But, yeah, generally I find it's like, you know, if you're ambitious and driven and then you, you create, you want to do more and you want to achieve more, but then you put these really unrealistic expectations and you don't, like we say, you don't 
set sort of milestones along the way and you don't celebrate those milestones as well. Yeah. Do you think that has come from as well, the people that were around you growing up? Um, were you given that, uh, well done, Carla? Were you motivated or was, were, were they just the same as well? Were they like, right, right you've done that, you've achieved that, eh? you've achieved that medal, brilliant, right, let's move on. Or did they really give you the encouragement that you deserved? Yeah, so that's a great question because um, I think that was another huge part for me was the only time I ever saw kind of reward or encouragement was overhearing my family talking to somebody else about me. So, you know, they would be, oh, somebody bad, else would say, oh, Carla did really well, you know, at that competition. And they'd be like, oh, I know, she was great. She really stepped up that day. But it was never said directly to me. Um, yeah. and, so, and that's so important. So if anybody's listening up there and they've got a high achiever child, that child needs to know that they are doing well, isn't it? Yeah. And I think, you know, it's also, even if they don't perform as well, like, I think that's even yeah. more important because, you know, I, I mean, I remember, this is such a, like, silly little example, but... Um, I don't it means you, a lot. It obviously means a lot because it's yeah, in your head. Totally. And it, I don't know if you had this, but it, in primary school, you used to have to take your tests home and get them signed by your parents. Um, no, so we used to have that. Okay, so yeah, we used to have to like, we'd do a test in class and you'd get your mark and then you had to take it home and your parents had to sign to say that they'd seen your result. Um, yeah. So both my parents used to be teachers. So um, yeah, one was in maths and geography and those were my two worst subjects. So that wasn't helpful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but yeah, I remember getting a B once and this was actually before my mom passed away, but and I actually was so terrified to take it <gasps> home that I forged her signature at like the age of seven or something ridiculous. Oh, um, no. and, and I think, you know, that's the kind of thing where if you're setting such unrealistic expectations and, and I also actually want to add there that something I've sort of figured out is I, I do think there's a lot of generational stuff that, yeah. that's come into it. Um, you know, if I look at, my mom and then her mom um there was definitely always this sort of high level of expectation to perform and to do well and so I think it really sort of when I had that trauma like that was my default mode because that was what I'd seen you know that was yeah. how how the woman in my life um yeah. behaved yeah yeah, you I, I, and it's interesting you say that because when we go back to exams and everything is that um, it was just good enough for me to to get 50%. Um, average was just good enough, you know, and that's sort of what I've carried through my life. It's just, as long as you just do it good enough, that's okay, you know. And, uh, yeah. and so it's interesting, you know, it was never pushed to... And then it was interesting because I remember my dad saying, you know, um, oh, what do you need history for? I think I had 25% in history. What do you need history for? Like, yeah, what do I need history for? I don't need it. You know, so it's it's interesting yeah. how these things. And you know what? I do not like history. <laughs> I, don't I do not like history. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting how these things carry us through, isn't it, to, to who we are who we are today but these things yeah. are important as well and and somebody was saying to me um oh it was actually um Sophia was saying to me yesterday that um that uh there was reasons for this and these she's sort of glad like she had like extremities happen to her like just as you have and it's like why me? Why did this happen to me? But actually, it's made her the person that she is today as well. Absolutely. What sort of, when was it like a pinnacle moment for you to think, hang on, or was there a pinnacle moment? Hang on a minute. Things need to change here. Yeah. Something I think needs to was, change. I think there was probably a couple of pinnacle moments for me. Um, I think yeah. I'm, 
again, that I'm one of those people I think the universe has to tell me a few times before I start to pay attention. You have to make a few mistakes. <laughs> I, think, I don't think you're on your own with that one. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm like, no, I've got this. I've got this. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I um, I had multiple moments where I attempted suicide. And I think those moments were really pinnacle for me in terms of resetting and going sort of, what the hell? Like, how did we get here? You know, how did, and I know that a lot of people say that with, you know, depression and that is like, how did I get here? Because it's not a thing that happens overnight. It builds up, you know, and um, so I think it creeps up moments, to you, you know, it creeps up on you and all of a sudden you're like, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. what? Like, where, how, where? We're well, like, I where did that come together. <laughs> yeah. And then, wham, yeah. bam. <laughs> totally. So I think those moments were big for me in, in starting to shift things and take a different path yeah. and make different decisions. Um, I think probably the next biggest learning I had was um, not that long ago, really, um, was probably about five or six years ago. I, um, I had massive burnout at work. Um, I had a ruptured artery in my stomach um, and I had to have like two blood transfusions and the whole, oh, wow. whole thing. And yeah. I think that really was a huge wake up call for me because I, I was just doing what I'd always done. You know, I was, I'd, I'd slipped back into those bad habits of pleasing everyone at work, never saying no to anything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I just took on more and more work. I was working like, you know, 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, and then with that comes poor lifestyle choices, you know, like drinking too much, eating takeaways all the time, all of that sort of stuff and not sleeping and, all of these things and and I think that sort of really hit home for me to say like you, you can't keep making these choices over and over again like these are choices that you are making you are creating this yeah, for yourself yeah. you know I think for you, many you many years take, you thought to take responsibility all of a sudden it yeah. was like I need to be responsible for my actions here yeah, and I think for so many years, maybe subconsciously without realizing it, I I blamed what had happened to me as a child as almost an excuse for the things that were not working in my life. And I yeah. was like, oh, well, you know, like I didn't have a great start or I didn't have a great role model or I didn't have this, um, yeah. you know, oh, I'm still carrying that pain. So I think subconsciously, because I wouldn't say it was conscious because I was like, no, you know, I'm, I've am i dealt with this. I'm on top of it. I'm, I'm okay. But I think subconsciously that programming was still saying, oh, this is why things don't work for you because of that. Or this is why things are not going well because of that. Um, and I think it was only in that moment where I was like, do you know what? Every single one of these things that has led to this hospital visit was my choice. Yeah. And you took I responsibility. Chose, yeah. I chose yeah. to not have boundaries at work. I chose to make poor health decisions. And, and there was nobody I could blame but myself. You know, you, obviously, mm. I, I tried to blame, you know, I mean, the company I worked for were not ideal. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, at the end of the day, it was me. And I think that really sort of that realization when you go, oh, my God, like, I cannot blame anything or any situation for what's going on except the choices that I'm making every day. Okay. It's quite interesting you say that because the same thing, the, the sun, I'm trying to move around the sun. Like <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit like. <laughs> um, it, the same, exactly the same thing happened to me. And I remember going to therapy and I didn't quite understand this at the time where the therapist said to me, um, you haven't dealt with, you haven't dealt with your issues. And I'm looking, I have. I thought I had dealt with my issues. I'm like, I, I didn't for years understand this was, it was in my brain. You haven't dealt, you haven't dealt. Okay, but I'm sure I have because I, they're not coming up anymore. Those issues are not yeah. coming up anymore. But it was when um, I reached out to um, Deb Morgan and Deb Morgan will be speaking here as well um, as a relationship um, coach where 
my marriage, my third biggest relationship. So I, I've had like uh, three relationships, big relationships. And this, my third one was on the seventh year. I know they say seven year itch and all that, but on the seventh year, I was feeling the same as my other two relationships. Mm. And I was like, there is one common denominator here. Not that I'm blaming myself for all this, but it was, this happens, this happened twice before. Hang on a minute now. Yeah. I need to fix this. And that's where my moment was like, I'm making the same mistake again. Yeah. So it's interesting, isn't it? It's like, it you is. think you're dealing with them, but you're not because it comes out yeah. to something else. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also, um, you know, and I'm sure it's probably a lot of the people you've spoken to would relate in terms of anybody who's gone through sort of extreme situations or extreme trauma, your your perception of, um, I guess, life or circumstances is quite extreme before you pay attention. Yeah. And this actually came up, a, a coach helped me see that they were like, when things are sort of, because we operate at such an extreme level, like small mundane things just don't even bother us. We're just like, yeah. it's fine, I got this. It's like things that might derail someone else are just not a big deal yeah. for me. Um, and I, you know, sometimes I've had to also learn that I need to be a bit more compassionate because sometimes I'm like, I don't understand why <laughs> you're struggling with this. No, no, I know. I mean, I mean, the same on that one. It's just like, uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's work ethics for me. It's like I could, could, I still not really can't fathom out why somebody has people haven't got work, work ethics. How somebody can go to work and drag their feet all day and then go home. I'm like, what a waste of time. You know, you you know, it's just, it's just like, I, like what you know, you, it, you go to work to work. <laughs> you know, that's fine along the way, obviously. You, 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 but, but it's just like, I, I can't fathom that out for the life of me why somebody would go to work and not work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. And I think that's why often like it takes sort of extreme moments for yeah. people like us to actually sit back and go, ah okay, I see what you're trying to teach me here. <laughs> yeah. So what sort of strategies did you use then to, 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 it's not changes. You said you hit something, a nail on the head, and I've written it down by here, is your habits. Some of your habits are so extreme, but you don't even know you're doing them because they're a habit. And I spoke, I spoke about this, um, um on what day are we uh, on wednesday evening about your habits you have to be aware of your habits if you want to achieve your goal now you're saying you have to be aware of your habits because they were extreme habits that were causing you problems in your day-to-day -day life yeah absolutely because i think your your habits can be so positive in your life but they can also be derailing depending on what the absolutely. habits are yeah. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, hundred percent. The awareness for me is huge. It's it's just catching myself and and reworking things that I'm doing. So, I have a tendency as well to um, take on too much. Um, yeah. And so, I need to be very aware because generally, actually, physically, my body tells me that I'm starting to get overwhelmed. And yeah. So I need to be aware of those sort of things and be able to say, like, look, no we're not in a good we're heading down a bad road here let's let's take a you know a moment to revisit what's what's important and what's not um yeah, yeah, yeah. i think it's also you know for me healthy daily habits as well like um mm -hmm. my my exercise and my nutrition and that's really important because when that's not in a good place my mental health is not in a good place and then i'm not making solid decisions you know in yeah. my life um, yeah, so yeah. that's a huge one for me um, because I feel like it's such a circle. It's like, you know, when your mental health is not great, you don't want to exercise, you don't want to eat well, but if you're not eating well, it, your mental health is it, 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 it's, it's a bad It's a very important one, isn't it? And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one to combat because when you're feeling low, you want to eat all the sugary foods, the chocolates and the biscuits yeah. and the, you know, and it, it's just somebody... Um, Somebody came over here the other day to me, you know, and not in a good place. And I was like, get a cup of tea and get the biscuits out, you know. <laughs> Imagine if I gave, 
imagine if I gave them sort of like an apple and a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't have worked. No, that wouldn't have worked, would it? But but it is, you yeah. know. I know we're laughing at it, but it is, and you, okay, that is fine for that moment, and it will pick me up. But then you can go go down that slippery slope, and that and that definitely yeah. that same thing happened to me as well. You know, I went from from super fit to couch potato, and um, you know, and and it, I was low, and it, it just doing the day to day things that I had to do were hard enough. And then yeah. trying to exercise and trying to eat healthily and go, planning my meals and all that type of thing. That was just, that was just a no-go, absolute no-go yeah. one point. Yeah. And I think so that's just, such a good segue into what I was going to mention as well, is that yeah. it's also allowing yourself the space to have that time as well like you know I think one thing I never did was if I was having a really bad day I'd just like push through and just like put all the stuff down like just push through just don't acknowledge anything just keep going um unfortunately yeah. it catches up with you <laughs> so I think it's really yeah. important to like you say sometimes you might need to take just an hour or two and just like actually I just need to go for a walk I can't do my yeah. normal gym session today. It might just be me doing a stretch session or going for a walk. Or it's, for me, it's just a form of movement that, but it yeah. doesn't always have to be the pressure to get it all right on the day, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like as well, that's that also sets it up for like subconsciously, are you a person who sticks to your decisions and to your, you know, like, I think the minute I say I'm going to do something and then I don't do it, it, it plants a seed in my head. You're a failure. I'm not reliable. Yeah. Oh, you're, she'll yeah. just give up. She won't carry on, you know. Um, and it's so, it's so powerful to just give yourself that space as well. Um, it's something that is really hard as a perfectionist to um, wow. allow yourself that downtime and just to not feel guilty about it. <laughs> Yeah, 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 no, and I agree. And I used to, it's quite interesting because I used to um, enjoy being ill because it gave me that um, reason to be in bed, to relax. Oh my God, to I can so relate. <laughs> it's like, oh, I've got a bad cold. <laughs> oh, I need to go to bed, you know? And it's like, oh, let's go to bed. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no one can disturb me. I used to say, no, like, say the best time of my day is like the eight hours I'm sleeping because nobody can annoy me nobody or can talk yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you had to have that reason. I had to have that reason to actually um, take that time out. There had to be a reason, but it doesn't have to be a reason. It, it, it's yeah. it's like um, we need to recharge the batteries. We and I, I said this actually to um, my stepson Joe. He's going to be talking on here as well. Is that you know he's just had a huge move in his life, a huge change, and lots of things that he has to deal with all at once. And I said to him, "It's okay to have a day off. Mm. It's okay to ring up your mates and go fishing for the day." And he was like, yeah. it's, "It was like a big relief for him. He's like, he's like, oh, I can do that. I'm allowed. I'm like." course i said because yeah. like you said you push through things you push through then you're not you're not working or you're not functioning where you no. where you want to be functioning you're just functioning yeah. just in swedish they say logum just right you know and it's just it's not that neither right nor wrong it's logum just there and um yeah. it's your 50 percent you test score <laughs> it's it might be exactly that it's exactly that and it's just there and then You'd recharge the batteries and you go back to whatever you were doing. You go, whoa, and you do it twice. You do it better. You do whatever yeah. you want You want to be doing better as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. It's amazing. And then, so is there anything that you would like, it's a hard question, this is, because I'm putting pressure on you, to say to anybody about, to, to inspire them, about the, with the journey that you've been on, is there anything that I've missed, that you'd like to say. <laughs> no, I Put think, um, yeah. Um, do you know, I think something you said um, that you'd mentioned, you were speaking to um, someone yesterday, and I think it's, it's the biggest thing that I've learned is 
is not having a regret for anything that you've been through, rather seeing it as part of the journey and who who you are. Because I had yeah. so much shame um, and embarrassment and um, you know, for years, obviously, I never spoke about it because I just thought people were going to judge me. They were going to judge my family. They were just going to not see me for who I am. And and there was so much pressure I was putting on myself over something yeah. that wasn't in my control. It was something that happened yeah. so long ago as well. And I think no matter whether, you know, I know we've been speaking a lot about perfectionism, but I think just in general in life, like we carry these things as if they are like, you know, a a negative battle wound but actually it's something we should be so proud of because we're still standing here today and we're still fighting and we're still trying to live our lives and we we're still doing another day and we're still being human you know and I think you know if you get up every day and you share your story and you just embrace life with all its rainbows and but also what <laughs> you know shit I can't think of another word <laughs> um, <laughs> you know but yeah I think but that's, yeah that's when you, it is a, you get through it the wise wise words there because I totally agree with you there you know it's it's just whatever life throws at you um catch that ball and hold it to your heart and learn by it uh, move forward take responsibility um, be aware of repeated actions that you or repeated um behaviors that you're doing to get you where you don't want to be um and yeah and follow your dreams because you're i know you're living it's not an easy life that you're living right now you're traveling you're traveling loads and I, I think everybody thinks you're traveling oh wow she could do this as well but it does take a soul a little bit as well but you've got yeah amazing life and I think it's the same with my life as well people say oh to live in a cabin in the forest with all those dogs you know doing the dog sledding and say what a dream life yeah 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 I don't feel like that all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah everything has its pros and cons for sure everything um, but take on and the I positive, think, take on the good things, yeah, isn't it? Exactly. And I think, yeah. yeah, I think there's basically two things that, like, if I had to summarize, I mean, there's all lots of little habits and things I do, but I think there's yeah. two things that, one is when things get tough, like the one big thing I learned is to not try to do it alone. Like, you've got to have people. Yeah. Um, because for so many years, I just internalized everything and try to figure out everything on my own. And the minute you reach out to somebody and I have different people for different things and um, that's been a game changer for me like you know if I'm having a really rough time I mean I still find it hard don't get me wrong like I, yeah, yeah. I'll message a friend and be like oh I don't really want to message her because I feel like a burden but I just do yeah. it anyway and then they come yeah. back and say you know what do you need Where, what what can I do so I guess that's the biggest lesson is don't do it alone because you don't need to um, and you're not going to be seen as a hero for trying to figure it out on your own um, well, and yeah I think the second thing you touched on is just I always ask myself what is this trying to teach me what am I supposed to learn from this more ways yeah, sometimes in the moment it's so hard you know like yeah, when yeah. you're in it you've just got to survive it but afterwards yeah always ask yourself like what was this here to teach me it's that's a reflection then isn't it and such wise words and this is a common theme with everybody i've spoken to um is that the people around you are very important uh the mm -hmm. people that you you know it's and, and everybody i've spoken to has had professional help as well and that i find yeah. is a massive it's it for me, that's a massive help because you can really spill out whatever words you want to say. You can swear, you can say things that come straight to your head and there's no judgment and then, you know, and they're not going to be like friends who are not <laughs> equipped for it. We're like, oh, well, let's have a cup of tea. Let's move forward. You know, let's go. <laughs> that's what happened to me. It's like when I thought <laughs> you go to a friend with a, with a problem and they can't deal with it. Oh, here's a bottle of chocolate. And I'm like, this does not work. <laughs> 
<laughs> not helpful at all. But then when you go to a professional, then, you know, you can, I felt relief that I could just say exactly what I wanted. Maybe never made any sense to anybody, but it came out, you know. So yeah. that's really important. And good friends around you and good people that yeah. build you up, not push you down. Um, and that's a common theme. The other common theme is awareness. The other common theme is take responsibility and move forward and figure out why you're here and look at your behavior it's it's just, it's just it just is and if you're repeating the same behaviors look at how we, we can change them and yeah. that can build confidence and then it, it helps you then to and this is what it's all about building your comp looking deep die deep inside yourself paul's biggest word dig deeper dig deeper into the <laughs> authentic you and um and then that allows you to like you and i follow our dreams and live the life that we we really want to do absolutely yeah um i think it's it's amazing like what you said about just the, the when you start to do the inner work you realize like the outer confidence that you can have because yeah. you you feel so much more peace with yourself um you know yeah. not comparing yourself to other people as well is important like you know we live in a world where all we see is is the beautiful stuff that's happening you know in people's lives um but every single one of us is going through stuff all the time everybody is everybody is and even if you think somebody's got it together they've got it together for that time but they've had something yeah. there's something yeah. that's got them there you know, it's not, they just haven't got it together just like that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, Carla, it's been amazing. Thank you so much for um, coming okay. on here and sharing your journey, your wise words, and thank just you like definitely. you're an inspiration to me. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's been amazing. Take care. Bye. Bye.